Welcome to a tech moment on Cannabis Tech. I'm your host, Christina Etter. In this podcast, we take just a few minutes to talk about some of the exciting science and technology that's changing and impacting the cannabis and hemp industries. And recently, cannabinoid potential has absolutely rocked mainstream headlines, and we've seen multiple studies that are grabbing national attention about the possibilities of particular cannabinoids. Everything from CBDA, CBGA, and even CBD have made national headlines recently about how they may have an impact on COVID infection. Now, of course, we're going to applaud these studies making it into mainstream news and really kind of gathering that momentum that we're looking for in in getting the potential out there. Unfortunately, there's been a steady stream of misinformation that also comes along with headlines like this making national attention. You know, in less than 12 hours time, I received 15 emails regarding the fact that cannabis can stop COVID. And I saw some headlines about how hemp can stop COVID, how CBD compounds can prevent COVID, how to protect yourself from COVID, and cannabis stops COVID-19. And these just kept rolling in, one right after the other. And unfortunately, a lot of the stories were absolutely rich with misinformation. Now, to help us discuss some of this and some of these recent headlines and the studies that are out there, I reached out to the most qualified person I know in the realm of acidic cannabinoids and their potential for medical use. Dr. Dustin Sulak is an osteopathic physician who is licensed in Maine as a general practitioner. He is an expert in integrative health with an intelligent combination of conventional and alternative approaches to healthcare. Dr. Sulek is an internationally renowned expert in medical cannabis. He is the founder of Integrate Health and Healer.com, a medical cannabis education resource. He is a passionate teacher of clinicians, patients, and industry professionals, and sits on the board of directors of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. Dr. Sulek recently published the first foundational text on the clinical use of cannabis and cannabinoid therapies, a handbook of cannabis for clinicians, principles and practice. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dr. Sulek, and taking the time out of your day for this. My pleasure, Christina. I look forward to the conversation. Well, Dr. Sulek, I have followed your work and your site since my first dive into the cannabis space back in 2016. And in fact, it's where my husband and I learned a lot of the information that we needed to make changes in our life and our our healthcare. But what I would love for us to start with is just give us a little bit of your background. Talk to me about what your practice in a great health does and that kind of aha moment when you realize the potential in cannabis medicine. Sure. So I've been interested in cannabis for a long time, uh, since my teens, uh, like a lot of us, and um, never really expected it to take over my medical career, even though I I realized that there was a lot that cannabis had to offer uh, from a health perspective. But uh, earlier on in my life, it was um, also more from like a creativity and a spiritual uh, perspective. But then back in 2009, I started a private practice here in Maine with the intention on offering my skill set, which was integrative medicine, as you mentioned, this combination of conventional medicine and complementary alternative medicine, as well as osteopathic manipulation. I also had a background in hypnotherapy and so uh, a general healing arts practice. And at that time, in the fall of 2009, Maine had just passed a medical cannabis law that allowed uh, a whole, you know, really thousands of patients in the state that were using cannabis illegally to begin using it legally as long as they had a doctor's signature, basically. And at the time, I was one of the only doctors in the state willing to offer that signature and probably the only one that was really interested in learning from my patients what they were doing with cannabis. So that's when cannabis kind of took over my career and, and went from being something that I was interested in and something that I appreciated to all of a sudden, uh, you know, front and center. I was learning so much from my my patients, turning to the primary research. And even back then, there was quite a bit of literature on the medical benefits of cannabis and, and, and the risks. And, um, and it kind of confirming what I was seeing with my patients, talking to some other people that have been in the field for longer and, uh, than myself, and um, really just so impressed by 
how many different fields in medicine uh, can be addressed with the same, uh, the same herb, essentially. So I was seeing patients with psychiatric conditions and gastrointestinal conditions and neurologic conditions, inflammatory conditions, uh, you name it, uh, highly refractory, meaning they had tried a bunch of conventional treatments and nothing was really working and they came in to see me and with cannabis and maybe a few other things that I had to offer, we were getting great results. And so that was 12 years ago and Fast forward to now, um, it's uh, been an incredible journey because I've had the opportunity to be an educator. As you mentioned, I have a, a textbook for clinicians. I do a lot of teaching and really um, mainstream medicine is eager to learn about this now uh, as a, a potential solution to their challenging cases, which is wonderful. And um, and then in my clinic, we've had made some uh, discoveries, I would say, one of which I think that's relevant to the conversation today has to do with these acidic cannabinoids. Um, and a lot of that came from the, the background in Maine is that uh, for years it was a very unregulated medical cannabis system here where there were literally thousands of different producers uh, and a lot of homemade and artisanal preparations. And so to help kind of sort through that in my practice, we set up a testing laboratory uh, that ran from about 2014 to 17. And uh, so people were bringing in uh, their homemade and artisanally made preparations. We were looking inside of them and finding out what was working and what wasn't working, what was the dosage range. And I think that that really uh, accelerated my understanding of how to safely and effectively use cannabis as a, a therapeutic tool um, and, and also really brought to my attention the power of the acidic cannabinoids. Fantastic. No, that's that's absolutely wonderful. And I, I'm glad that you touched on, you know, kind of your background into understanding the acidic cannabinoids and their potential as well. And before we really dive into that topic, and since we're talking about the past any, anyway, one of the things that I wanted to ask your perspective on is, you know, there's there's been a lot of legal red tape that has prevented good, meaningful research in the United States. Now, as we're starting to see that start to change, do you feel like it's the anecdotal, anecdotal stories that are really kind of pushing for the research to back this up? Or is it the economic benefits that are pushing lawmakers to kind of lift the veil on research? Or do you think it's kind of a combination of both? Just what do you think is really kind of pushing for more of this cannabis research that we're seeing come out now? Yeah, I think it's really mixed. C cannabis, um, in many ways, turns things upside down, and, and research is certainly one of them. I mean, the typical pathway for drug development is studying, you know, novel molecular compounds and getting some signals from them, and then testing them out in in vitro, meaning petri dish type studies, and then animal studies, and then if they look good there, moving on to uh, phase one through three human clinical trials. And what we see with cannabis is, in many ways, the opposite. You know, people People, lots of them, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people reporting cannabis is working for this, us having no idea why or how or uh, any of the details about that because it is all anecdotal. And then uh, sometimes we see observational research, which I think makes a lot of sense in this setting when you already have a lot of people using something that we know has a uh, safety range that's acceptable for clinical trials and um, and they're reporting something. It makes sense to, to just study that group that's already out out there and figure out what is that signal what are they reporting and and what kind of details can we get and now and then it's like this this whole process in reverse right sometimes then we see it goes back to the cell or back to the animal study or sometimes uh, to the uh, human clinical trial that's a controlled trial by observational I mean we're just watching to see uh, what's happening out there in in nature meaning like uh, it, you know in, in the world when people are using cannabis versus a clinical trial that would be experimental where one group is given cannabis and another group is given a control whether it's a placebo or some type of other active treatment to compare it against to see if it's how it how it uh, works in, in comparison with that control and, and so they're all valuable all these different approaches to cannabis research are important and they, they give us information I'm hungry for this data I you know read lots of papers every month and it's constantly informing uh, the evolution of my clinical practice and, and these two papers uh, that we're going to discuss today are, are uh, included in that category now uh, b because there's a pathway to bring cannabis-based or cannabis-derived drugs 
through like FDA approval. We've now seen this happen with Epidiolex. I think that there's a lot more research funding uh, coming into the space to help it go in that direction. Uh, there's uh, also a lot of um, motivation in the cannabis industry, what we could kind of consider the over-the-counter cannabis industry, whether that's adult use or the uh, the medical regulatory framework. And and there's a lot of uh, you know momentum there as well to improve products, improve extraction technology, um, you know, make this safer and more effective for everyone. And and cannabis has all these different niches. And so I, I think it's a, it's a a lot is happening. But what's great is that yes, that the end result is we are seeing a lot more data from every one of these categories, from the very preclinical all the way up to the randomized controlled trials. Uh, we're getting a lot of information. It is just so exciting, just so exciting. I think to see how much research is starting to come out and and see new things happening, like the new research facility in New Mexico, those kinds of things. Now, in our publication, we have discussed in the past um, your specific low pressure, low temperature extraction process. And what I would like for you to do is just briefly explain what makes your process a little bit different and why did you choose that particular method for extracting your hemp products? Sure. Um, yeah, so the, the quick story is that when I had this testing lab set up and I was like hungrily looking for what is it about some cannabis products that make them work better than others, I uh, very quickly started seeing a signal that products which were not fully heated, and by fully I mean in, in cannabis the heat drives the conversion of the acidic cannabinoids to the neutral or decarboxylated cannabinoids. So let me explain that just really briefly. A lot of people think, oh, cannabis produces THC and CBD, which is actually not the case. The plant itself produces precursors to those compounds, and those precursors are acidic, and that's where the A comes from. So the plant makes THCA. When THCA is left at ambient temperature, it very slowly converts into THC, and when it's heated, it converts a lot more rapidly. Same is true with CBD. Cannabis produces CBDA, and then the CBDA can be converted to CBD with heat through a process called decarboxylation. And so I, I was noticing these acidic cannabinoids were present in the products that I was most interested in because patients were reporting that they were working really well. And there was um, one kind of series of patients in particular. This was back in 2014. Everyone was really excited about CBD. My practice had kind of rapidly shifted from mostly treating adults with chronic pain and PTSD. Plus, you know, there were, there were always a mix of conditions, but P chronic pain and PTSD was probably about 75% of the time I was in the office seeing patients. And it seemed like overnight, about 50% of my time was suddenly spent on pediatric neurology. And that, of course, correlated with the first episode of Sanjay Gupta's Weed series, in which he uh, you know, detailed the, uh, the story of Charlotte Figge and how CBD was working for treating refractory seizures. So parents were networking, talking about cannabis and coming in and I was very excited because uh, there was a patient there who had purchased a CBD product from a local dispensary. CBD was newly available in Maine. Uh, they brought the product in with them. There was no uh, indication on the label of how potent it was, how much CBD was in it, but it was working really well for seizures. And so I said, well, great, we just set up this lab. Let's test what's in this bottle and get an idea of how many milligrams of CBD do you need to address your seizures. And when we looked in that product, there was no CBD in it. There was almost no THC in it. There was just a very tiny amount of THCA, surprisingly low. And I thought, oh, how could this be? THCA, and, and just for the frame of reference for the listeners and viewers, up until this point, like 99% of the research on cannabis had looked at these neutral or decarboxylated cannabinoids. THCA was considered, for the most part, an inactive precursor. And and so I was I thought the same thing. You know, I believe the research. Oh, well, this is probably not that important. This, this THCA, what, what's it doing here? Um, maybe this is a placebo effect. I don't know what's happening. You know, I didn't really believe it until a couple more patients came in using that same product from the same dispensary.
dispensary that was labeled CBD that had no CBD in it. Well, why did they label it CBD? Because people were appreciating it, but it wasn't getting anyone high. That's all they knew because they, they didn't have it tested. And, uh, and that's another important distinction uh, for the listeners is that THCA, unlike THC, does not cause euphoria. It does not cause impairment. It, it, it has a different uh, set of mechanisms in the body. There, there's some overlap, but a lot is different about it. So anyways, that, that's one of the stories. You know, then I started believing, wow, THCA does help some people with seizures, and uh, it actually works at surprisingly low doses. And I started using it as a, a, a recommended treatment in some of my seizure cases and seeing really good results. So around that time, uh, I was um, getting involved. My, uh, the company that I helped found, Healer, we started off as a primarily an education company, but we also uh, wanted to move into helping uh, improve the quality of the products in the cannabis marketplace. And we were talking about different methods of extraction. And I uh, immediately knew that I wanted to develop a method of extraction and formulation that did not use high levels of heat or pressure because I, I knew that these unheated raw cannabis compounds or, or you know the, the ones that the plant makes the acidic cannabinoids were going to be very important to to keep around in the final product and so this is what led ultimately to the development of a a cold low pressure ethanol extraction system uh, that we developed at healer uh, we also have a patent on the use of nanofiltration uh, that can uh, kind of clean up and prepare uh, these extractions and so it's it's um it's a finely, finely ground cannabis, and then that's uh, extracted into ethanol. The ethanol is treated to remove some of the chlorophyll, mostly for palatability, and, and so it doesn't upset the GI system. And then using these nano filters, which we have adapted uh, with technology from the water industry, we can uh, kind of take out things we don't want, like um, you know, proteins and uh, bacterial uh, uh, contaminants and other microbial uh, components. And we can keep in everything that we want, including the acidic cannabinoids, the terpenes, the flavonoids. And then we get a choice after all of that uh, extraction. What do we want to do with this? Do we want to keep it completely in its unheated form where there's high levels of these acidic cannabinoids? Do we want to partially decarboxylate it or fully decarboxylate it? And that, that's the story with our healer formulas. And so if you look at uh, healercbd.com or healercannabis.com and, and you take a look at our formulas, they all contain at least small portions of the acidic cannabinoids. And that's, again, based on my clinical experience and some of this emerging research, which you're seeing, uh, that, um, that it, it really helps uh, even when there's just a, like 15% um, non-decarboxylated. Um, but some of our formulas are like our, our CBDA has never been heated. That stuff has you know, been kept at cold temperatures. It's shipped. We tell people to keep it in their refrigerator if they're not going to use it quickly because um, it's, it's hard to do, right? It's, a lot of companies aren't doing this because it requires some extra time, effort, and uh, attention in figuring out how to do it. But in the end, it's actually a very cost-effective method that we've developed for preserving what I find uh, to be these very important compounds. Fantastic. And that is exactly why I wanted to have you on the show to talk about these new studies. And, and when I saw these first come out, like I said, you were the first name that popped into my mind because I knew that you had this background with acidic cannabinoids and their benefits. So let's talk briefly about the, the Oregon study that's recently made headlines talking about the CBDA and CBGA as a COVID preventative. Now, from your perspective, with all of this background that you have as as a, an industry leader in these acidic um, cannabinoid form formulations, um, what what does this kind of research say to you? So I think that this is exciting that the research is being done, and we we can talk more about some of the methodology in the Oregon paper that really landed uh, their focus on the acidic cannabinoids because I think that's something that doesn't happen a lot. There's you know a couple research groups out there that keep turning out papers on CBDA and THCA and and so forth, but really this is not widespread in the cannabis research world. It's still a very small niche, and and so this group uh, started with a process that 
it shifted their focus to the acidic cannabinoids. And for me, I, I'm just hungry for any data I can get uh, when it comes to these compounds. But the data in the study isn't really ready for um, a, a translation to the clinic. You know, what's more important to me is what my patients are saying. Now, I, I have been treating a lot of COVID. This is another, you know, in, inevitability of being in general practice and having a large patient population. People are getting COVID and people are also worried about getting it and wanting to be prepared. And I've, I've been having a signal about CBDA in COVID for the last you know, six months or so, where a lot of people are saying, well, they love the CBDA for the body aches and the headaches, and it helps uh, them feel like their COVID symptoms are more mild. And um, you know, and it, it makes sense. It's, there's anti-inflammatory aspects of it. People like it for those symptoms anyways outside of COVID. And, and so that's what I find interesting. You know, I, that, that's um, what informs my clinical practice. And so I might recommend a patient, hey, if you have CBDA at home and you have COVID, go ahead and, and take that. Or, you know, it might help with those symptoms. Seeing this research in the back of my mind, and maybe even when I speak to them, I say, and there's some, you know, very early preclinical research that shows this might even help with the disease process and not just the symptoms, but really it's, it's far too early to know that and to also know if we can um, feasibly reach doses that are, are relevant, you know, to these results. Right, right. And, you know, I, I think that's obviously very, very important, too, is that, <clears throat> like you said, this is very early research. We don't know the details. We don't know dosing factors. We don't know that, you know, and that this is actually going to cross over into to humans as well. I mean, obviously, we have our hopes that it does. It's so hard working with cannabis in some ways because it works so well. And, you know, it's, um, it sounds like a panacea. You know, of course it helps with COVID. It could help, you know, it helps with everything. Like that's kind of the attitude in the cannabis industry, which seems a little crazy. But also there is a physiologic basis for that, especially in regards to THC, which we know is mimicking these compounds that our body produces called the endocannabinoids. And, uh, and the, our body body makes these compounds for regulating every other system, you know, the brain, the nervous system, the uh, immune system, the gut, and, and all of these different things. And so if we can uh, interface with that endocannabinoid system, it really makes sense that a medicine could have widespread, uh, you know, effects in a range of different conditions, which is what we see with cannabis. We know that in uh, acute COVID, there's this uh, cytokine storm, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners are uh, familiar with. And we have a lot of evidence that interfacing with the endocannabinoid system can dampen down excessive inflammation and excessive immune activity. So it makes sense that it would, it would work there. And uh, certainly there's been signals from my patients and even my own personal experience Experience when I had COVID, I was uh, confused and surprised by how much better I felt with a little THC. I mean, it was, I, I, I say confused because I thought I was over it and then the THC would wear off and the symptoms would recur. It worked that well that I, I really thought uh, that the condition had resolved. Um, but what, what I think is really interesting about these uh, researchers in Oregon is, uh, you know, probably like a lot of us, they're thinking, well, there's going to be some botanicals that are going to help with COVID. And out of those botanicals, cannabis is probably a pretty good candidate because it's just a treasure chest of different medicinal compounds, many of which are anti-inflammatory. So let's take a look at cannabis and see, you know, what's in there that could potentially help with COVID. And these researchers were specifically focused on the spike protein. And so as many of the listeners know, the spike protein is this protein on the outside of the virus of COVID and it attaches to the ACE2 enzyme on the human cell, on the cell membrane. This is kind of the entry point of COVID into the cell. And if you could find something that kind of uh, glues onto or blocks that spike protein, it could disrupt the virus's ability to latch onto and get into the cell. And, and so that's what these researchers were specifically looking at. And the first assays they did were um, to kind of expose the spike protein to a wide variety of compounds and then see what's sticking and then take the ones that are sticking and move forward with those with some other studies. And um, surprisingly, it wasn't the compounds that everybody's talking about, the THC and the CBD that stuck to the spike protein. It was the acidic cannabinoids. It was CBGA, THCA, and CBDA that were sticking to the spike protein. And um, 
And that's that's wonderful because this was like kind of the first breakthrough. Uh, you know, I think it's just great that those compounds were even in the roster, right? They're so overlooked. So just the fact that they were included in these experiments and then turned out to be the best candidates uh, gets me excited. And um, so then they, uh, but back to your comments about what's going on with cannabis research and some of the challenges with it, uh, this group was unable to move forward with THCA. They had to leave that out of the subsequent um, studies because it's uh, a Schedule One substance and very expensive and, and difficult to work with. You need special uh, regulatory approval. And so they, they move forward with CBGA and CBDA. And of course, those are the two that made the headlines. But based on their first assay, we would expect THCA to perform similarly in the uh, in vitro, the cell models and in the animal models. Interesting. And, and how disappointing that, that the legal restrictions are preventing good qualified research or, or, you know, requiring researchers to leave out particular compounds just because of the red tape that's behind it or the cost behind it because of the scheduling. That's just so disappointing to me to see things like that still happening. <laughs> yeah, it's still happening. And especially for THCA, because that's the most available, right? Like any cannabis, you know, probably 95% of the cannabis out there is what we call type 1 cannabis, which is so-called THC dominant. But what that means is that if it's raw, it's really THCA dominant. Uh, you know, anyone in a legal or medicinal state can go pick up a uh, cannabis flower that is rich in THCA and have access to this compound. CBDA and CBGA are going to be a lot harder to come by. Of course, you know, Healer has uh, products, you know, a few other companies do. But again, like the processing is challenging. You need to, need to have special uh, equipment and, and technology to, to make those products. And it's really hard to find raw flour that's CBDA dominant or CBGA dominant. And so it's, yeah, it is a shame that THCA didn't catch um, more of the exposure in this study and, and as, as well as the media headlines, but we'll, we'll probably uh, get there eventually. Maybe someone in a different country where it's easier to do this research will pick up where they left off. Right. Right. And it's, it's just so exciting. I think at, at, this moment to see this happening and to see studies like this start to come out and, and really gain the attention that we want it to. And I feel like this just kind of opens up that door to even more research, you know, down the road and, and really starting to grasp and understand how those individual cannabinoids or compounds even, because we know that it's not all cannabinoids too, um, how these compounds really can be beneficial to the consumer. And, and I feel like now is just that, um, kind of a watershed moment really to where we're we're able to start moving into that realm and and start to prove and and put some of the data behind um obviously what thousands and thousands of people have been have been working towards for for years now i agree so uh can i offer your listeners some of the details about these studies we would love to hear them absolutely Okay, so so after finding that the CBDA and the CBGA were the best candidates, actually in the other order, CBGA seemed to bind the spike protein the best, followed by THCA and then CBDA, uh, the researchers went and uh, basically bathed these human cells in these compounds and then introduced the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and looked at, well, was the virus infecting the cells or not? And what they found was that at a high enough concentration of CBDA or CBGA, they were able to basically prevent the infection. And again, remember, that's, that's what they were going for, preventing the cells from getting the virus inside of them. Then the cells uh, are not becoming factories for more virus, and that kind of halts this whole disease process. And so the, the concentration uh, roughly that was effective was a 25 micrograms per milliliter. They tested three different varieties of uh, the, the COVID, you know, three different variants, and they found that it was similarly effective. Some of them needed a little more, some of them needed a little less, but in general it was about 25 micrograms per milliliter. So, you know, when I read that, I first went to, okay, what's everything we know about how high the blood levels are of these compounds in, in rodents or in humans when they take that? And is this clinically relevant? Now, there's been some studies administering, or one in particular that I found interesting from just a year or so ago, uh, that administered kind of like a, um, a broad spectrum cannabis compound 
by mouth to rodents. A lot of the rodent studies are injection uh, into the abdomen. And so this was looking at oral absorption and bioavailability, which I think is more relevant to humans. And uh, yes, with both of these t compounds, they were able to achieve blood levels that were at or above 25 micrograms per milliliter, the concentration found to be effective in the Petri dish. And so, um, so I thought, well, you know, there's the, maybe this is possible. I looked at all the human studies that uh, had ever evaluated uh, CBDA in the blood. There's really none that evaluated CBGs, just a few for CBDA and, and THCA, including one uh, vaporizer study looking at CBDA. And what what these found uh, were much lower levels in the blood. And so I'm going to actually switch units here to make it uh, comparing apples to apples. So the Oregon study in the Petri dish, uh, we're talking 25,000 nanograms per milliliter was the concentration that was effective at inhibiting the infection. And the studies looking at the blood of CBDA, the blood levels of CBDA or THCA are more like in the range of 90 or 30 or, you know, 70 nanograms per milliliter. So again, we're talking like double digits compared to 25,000. There's a pretty big difference there. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll give the caveat that blood levels don't tell the whole story, right? That's just how much is in the blood. It doesn't tell us how much is in the, the lymphatics. Some of these compounds may concentrate there. It doesn't tell us about tissue levels, like in the lungs or in the upper respiratory tract, where this type of, you know, information might be more relevant. You know, we're not measuring those things in people, obviously. We're not taking biopsies of their tissue. Uh, but I, I just want to point out that we're pretty far away from that concentration in the blood. Um, and, and, you know, what are, what are these like? So, um, for example, taking about 10 milligrams of CBDA by mouth, uh, blood levels up around 90 nanograms per milliliter. Again, compared to 25,000, that's a lot lower. Now, there's a, there, there's a caveat here. It, you know, um, sometimes when we look at uh, these uh, petri dish and even animal studies and we find the required concentration, when we then translate that work to humans, it turns out we need even higher levels of that compound to have the same effects. We didn't expect to need more, you know, but we did. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes researchers are surprised that they need much less. And I've seen this happen with cannabis before. In, in particular, some of the cannabinoids um, in relation to breast cancer. Uh, in, the, in the petri dish, you need much higher levels to, to kill the cancers, but in the rodents, you need way lower levels. So, you know, it's, it's, it's never a direct translation. We, we don't exactly know what to expect. And I think what we've seen from uh, some other compounds that can be helpful in treating COVID, uh, that, um, that the Petri dish studies don't tell the whole story. I think ivermectin is a good example of that. Now, I, I know ivermectin is controversial, and some people think it's the savior, and some people think it's uh, the devil, and I'm sure it, it uh, you know, fall somewhere in between. Um, but w when it really comes down to it, there are uh, large, ran well, medium and medium sized randomized controlled trials, large meta analyses with thousands of patients in there. And, and some of these analyses show that there is a signal that ivermectin is doing something like preventing mortality or speeding recovery or, or actually preventing the transmission uh, or the acquisition of the virus. And and some of them say, well, there's no, no real effect with ivermectin, but at least there's a little signal. And if you look at that, that first ivermectin study that came out at the beginning of the pandemic, it was all, you know, preclinical, like in vitro petri dish. And, and those blood levels were very high. I mean, those concentrations that were required to inhibit COVID in the petri dish were really high. When I saw that study and I did the same thing I did with CBDA and I looked at all the human data and I said, well, ivermectin is never going to get to these levels in the blood. Like, what are we going to do? Take like a thousand times? the recommended dose and I kind of gave up on ivermectin early and then the human studies came in and said well it actually is working uh, in some of these studies you know in some ways and so I think that's a nice reminder that we can always be surprised we might not need to take uh, 10,000 times the typical dose of CBDA to get blood levels uh, you know to make this effective but we just don't know that's the point right right now 
Like you said, I, I think it's absolutely phenomenal that we're starting to see this research and that, that mainstream news is picking up. I, I mean, I, I literally saw this headline, I think, in some of the, the biggest publications I've ever seen cannabis headlines in. And and obviously, we're, we're excited about that kind of information. But at the same time, like I mentioned, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And, you know, I, I, I saw headlines that, that talked about smoking cannabis will cure COVID. And, and I, I just had to shake my head because that's just simply not true and there's there's a lot of things out there how do we combat misinformation like this i'm not sure i think combating misinformation has been kind of a, a problematic uh effort in in a lot of ways and has led to a lot of censorship and and even greater misunderstandings uh, in my career what i've always done is just try to uh, put out there what i believe to be the correct information the truth and and let people decide but like if somebody is is going to believe anything you know fill in the blank cannabis or anything else cures covid um, you know, that's, that's a problematic starting place, right? That, um, the, these medicines, they don't cure COVID. COVID is a, a viral disease. You know, there's ways of preventing it. There's ways of treating the acute symptoms, perhaps shortening the course of it, helping people fully uh, recover from it. These are the strategies. So even beginning, you know, beginning with a search for a cure, uh, you're already off on the wrong foot. And I, I don't know how to help people that, that are starting from that place. I, I'm not sure. But what I did, you know, very thoroughly is when I talk about these studies, and we can certainly get into this, looking at uh, clinically relevant uh, scenarios and and concentrations, right? So these studies, we know the levels in the petri dish of these compounds that were effective. We know the levels in the animals that were effective, and then we have a little bit of data on how high do blood levels of these compounds get when people take cannabis and when they take CBDA or CBGA, and and you know could we feasibly reach those levels? And you know I'm I'm happy to comment on that. It's, it's still these are questions, right? I could uh, I can't answer it for sure until we until we get more. Research research. But what's the, I guess another way to combat misinformation is that um, a lot of people aren't comfortable with ambiguity, right? They don't want, well, we don't know enough yet. <laughs> like that's, that's just not a satisfying answer. So they'll keep grasping for, for something that's more definitive, even if that kind of takes them off track uh, of credibility, you know, just because they, they really want that answered. And so I, I think to begin with, we all have to be satisfied. Well, you know, you know, with with the idea that uh, cannabis, uh, when used uh, kind of within a range of uh, therapeutic doses and delivery methods, is uh, relatively safe for most people, and that it helps ameliorate symptoms, many different conditions. That it's likely that it could help in some way with COVID. It seems to be doing that for some people, and there's some human evidence of that. Uh, but in, in terms of particulars, how much CBDA should I take? How much CBGA should I take? Should I take it before I get COVID? Should I wait till after I get COVID? All those other questions. W the best experts in the field do not have those answers. So you're going to have to be satisfied not having those answers as well. Right. And that makes that makes sense. I, I understand that perspective too. That uh, and and I think that's been kind of um, a sticking point here for the last couple of years is is those questions of well we really just don't know yet or the answers of we just really don't know yet. And, and I think you're right. I think that does leave people kind of uncomfortable. But one of the things that I find encouraging about this, and I would love to hear your perspective on, is that I feel like because of the relevance of this research and because of just how. Um, uh, how COVID has kind of taken over everything. Um, this is really going to help push for more research. I think this is going to kind of open up those doors, kind of open up minds a little bit to the possibilities. So I would love to hear your perspective on where you think that research like this um, and headlines like we've seen in this last couple, three weeks is going to take us here in the future. Well, uh, kind of back to where we started with observational research. So for better or worse, we are about to have, or we're probably currently having due to those headlines, a lot of people take these compounds with COVID or uh, in trying to prevent COVID. And so 
um, to start with, I would love to find uh, innovative ways to gather that data from the people who are kind of volunteering themselves as, um, you know, N of one studies or, or anecdotal uh, experiences that that's very informative. And um, the second study that we might have time to discuss today uh, from uh, Chicago, uh, looking at CBD, not CBDA, they, they had a little bit of human evidence in there. And, it, you know, it just kind of gives us a, a hint of what's what might be possible. Um, but I think there's a lot of people doing this now. I would love for um, us in the cannabis world to get together and uh, get some of that data collected and, and see what trends we find. Um, and then the slower path, of course, is that, yes, this is uh, very relevant uh, preclinical data that warrants further investigation. I don't think anyone that could read these studies would argue with that statement. And so, um, yeah, researchers are looking uh, for uh, future publications and, uh, and interesting solutions to treat this pandemic. And I'm sure that others are going to pick up where these studies left off. Definitely, definitely. And I, I just feel like, you know, we're, we're still in such an infancy stage, I feel like here in the United States, that, that the research here is just going to snowball over the next few years. I, I really feel like it's really going to pick up steam. Now, recently, Pfizer announced an acquisition within the cannabis industry, and that's, you know, kind of that first cue that the big pharma is starting to take, you know, take this into a, a more serious consideration. And, and with that information in mind, and with your practice and what you have going on in Maine, where do you think we're going to be with cannabis in, say, the next 15 to 20 years? How do, how do you feel like the industry is going to evolve? Oh, wow. It's it's hard to think there that far, but I do believe that we'll see more prescription products that are based on cannabis and probably uh, synthetic molecular derivatives of compounds found in cannabis. So, you know, single molecule drugs uh, that are um, very similar, but just slightly different to what we find in the plant. I think we're going to see more of those. Um, I think we're going to see other therapeutics that uh, target the endocannabinoid system that really have nothing to do with the plant cannabis, except for the fact that cannabis helped us discover this, um, this uh, physiologic system. Um, I also think we're going to start seeing more over-the-counter products, uh, you, you know, but that not not um, relegated just to cannabis dispensaries and uh, and um, you know adult use shops, but also to the regular pharmacy. I think we're going to see that, uh, and and or maybe in the supplement section of the health food store. You know, we already have um, some endocannabinoid molecules that are available in that setting. So, so I think that's what, what we're going to see in terms of product availability. I think that this artisanal marketplace is not going to be replaced by any means by what I just mentioned, but is actually going to get stronger and stronger because there is no one right product. There's no like 10 right products. You know, it's, it, there's just so much inter individual variability in the way people respond to cannabis. I think we're going to make great advances, again, with the help of some of this observational data, is um, accelerating the process of figuring out what's right for the individual. So if you are this age and this gender and you have this background and you're having these symptoms, where is the best place to start with cannabis? And if that doesn't work, what's the best plan B based on what, you know, tens of thousands of other people like you have tried, or maybe even based on your genetics or based on some of your laboratory results. I mean, you know, when we can start adding in all that data, that's what I'm excited for is the, the personalized medicine aspect of this, which of course is going to overflow from the cannabis space into the natural products and even the, the conventional medicine. I mean, it, it's, it's so interesting to see cannabis kind of leading medicine, uh, sometimes, um, uh, you know, like a, uh, a mule digging its heels in and not wanting to go, but like forcibly leading medicine into uh, individualized uh, treatments for people. This is not, you know, a one size fits all single molecule for everybody with that condition. Uh, th there's just so many uh, nuances and what we're understanding the complexity in biology and that's coming into medicine more and more. So I, I think that's one of the real gifts of med of cannabis is that it's um, it's having a profound effect even outside of the cannabis sphere in medicine. 
Right, right. You know, that's one of the things I think that has always fascinated me all along. And that's that's what pulled us, um, my husband and I, into the industry in the first place was looking for uh, a, a better way. We we were taking so many pharmaceuticals in the Midwest um, between the two of us. And, and in our first four years out here in Colorado, we were able to eliminate all of them and, and make such a big difference in our health and our life. And we understand that it's not necessarily for everyone, but for for us and the way that it worked for us, it was absolutely miraculous. And so we're, we're so excited to see research like this starting to come out, starting to put some of that scientific data behind the anecdotal stories. I, I think in terms of long term, when, when we're looking at, you know, changing laws and and changing approaches to healthcare, I really feel like cannabis and can, uh, cannabinoid therapies are, are going to really lead that that charge in in changing the way that we look at healthcare from being more proactive, more about prevention, more about taking an accountability in our health um, process than it is about taking a pharmaceutical and trying to band-aid a problem or band-aid a symptom, and then you end up taking more pharmaceuticals to band-aid the symptoms that come from those. And and so I, I really feel like cannabis is going to be that driver to to help discover new ways of of improving our overall well-being and our in our health care so well said christina it is absolutely doing that and it's you know i think while, while we're on that topic it's it's even more than that right like cannabis then pulls in these other kind of um, aspects like cannabis assisted therapy is something that i you know cannabis is an adjunct to whether it's physical therapy or, or psychotherapy you know that's that's a whole nother realm and i think we're going to start seeing that open the door uh probably for other um other medicines in that same regard we see um you know cannabis uh as a kind of like a, a spiritual medicine getting this acknowledgement finally that it's not just that it relieves pain and that it's not just that it relieves anxiety or helps you sleep but that it also helps people feel connected to themselves helps them feel connected to the universe and that there actually is some medical value to having these kind of euphoric experiences uh you know i i think that's a that's a beautiful gift i've been kind of waiting for that acknowledgement and talking about it but i'm starting to see it more and more that this is a valid aspect of cannabis therapeutics so it's yeah, what an incredible plant, right? It's, you know, it, it always seems too good to be true, which I know I've already said in this interview. And, um, but, you know, when, when it really boils down to it, like, what do we learn about cannabis and, and COVID from these two studies? Well, you know, if, if you use it at the right concentration in a Petri dish or in the mouse, it seems to kick COVID's butt. Like, and, and who, who wouldn't have expected that of this medicine, of this medicine plant that does so many other things? Like, uh, you know, I think that's um, if I had to guess, did cannabis do anything for COVID or nothing for COVID? Of course, it would have been. Yes, it, it probably can help in the Petri dish and in the animal at the right concentration. And now the next questions are, you know, can, does that apply to humans? Is that clinically relevant? But before we sign off, the last thing that I would love for you to do is is tell our audience about Healer.com. Tell us a little bit about the educational offerings, because I know that you do very, very informational webinars on the regular as well. And, and so I would just love to have you tell our audience where they can go to get more information and, and to follow the, the wonderful educational opportunities that you put out there. Sure. So healer.com is our patient education website, and that information is free. Uh, we started that about seven years ago with the goal of providing anyone in the world with enough information to help them get started and get great results safely with cannabis, whether you're in kind of a, a regulated em environment where you have access to cannabis shops or whether you're you know, get, still getting it in the underground market or growing it in your backyard. Uh, we try to make that information kind of accessible for everyone. And, and I think we've done a really good job of that. So that's all free on healer.com. There's also a bunch of wellness activities on there like breathing exercises, meditations, and, and uh, physical exercises that I think go really well with cannabis. So if you're interested, you can check those out. We also have an online training and certification program. So this is for people that want a deeper dive into cannabis. Um, we, we have a, a very mixed audience in there, and I love it. But uh, there's about 20% clinicians. Uh, there's a lot of dispensary agents and uh, bud tenders, industry professionals, and then a lot of patients and caregivers of patients that just really 
want to know uh, the the deep dive in cannabis, but translated to someone that doesn't need a scientific background. So that's what the online training program does. Um, it, part of that program are um, these webinars that I do each month where I look at studies like the one we discussed today and uh, usually about four or five of them each month. You know, there's just so many coming out. It's very hard to narrow it down to uh, to the most exciting, the most clinically relevant, but that's what I do. And we present those live. And so if you go to healer.com and you get, um, you know, just give us your email address, we'll notify you when the next webinar is. And you can stay up to date on the latest clinically relevant cannabis research. Now, um, those sessions are recorded but only available to the people that have purchased the online training certification program and uh, and we've been doing it since 2018 so there's this incredible library of research plus questions and answers uh, that's all time stamped so you can go right to the topic of interest and that's also included in the training program and then uh, for those of you that are interested in our products, uh, which I mentioned earlier, we have a CBDA product, uh, we, we have a CBG, CBGA product, and we're coming out with new products as well. Um, that's um, healercbd.com for our hemp-based products, and then healercannabis.com for the THC-containing products that currently are available in Maine and Maryland. Nice, nice. Do you have plans to maybe expand out into the rest of the the country eventually? Are we are the are the rest of us going to get to have the healer cannabis experience? Absolutely, we are a small organization. We're always very interested in partners. Um, check out our product line if you are a cannabis producer in a state other than Maine or Maryland and interested in uh, bringing our formulary, uh, which was really just designed for me uh, and my patients. You know, I very selfishly uh, we just wanted to kind of eliminate the wild goose chase around finding the right formula and be able to work within a, a formulary that contains the acidic cannabinoids that's consistent and, and designed uh, based on my 12 years of clinical experience. And if, if you're also interested in something like that and, and you have the capacity to uh, bring that to another state, I would love to hear from you. Fantastic. Dr. Sulak, this has been kind of one of those rock star moments for me. I've followed your work for a long time. It's, uh, you know, your site is what helped my husband and I learn a lot of what we learned for, for making our own transition here in the, in the cannabis space. So it, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you here on the show. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been fantastic. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure, Christina. <laughs>